Hi, my name is Joe Lasco, and I am here at the Center for Computer Research uh, and Music and Acoustics uh, at Stanford University, otherwise known as Karma. Uh, we're interviewing Fernando Lopez Lescano today in connection with his upcoming performance in the Outsound New Music Summit of 2013. Um, and uh, Fernando will be having a piece called Knock Knock, Anybody There?, that will be part of the program uh, in, in the Computer Music Night on the 25th of July, 2013. Um, Fernando, thank you so much for making the time to, yeah, uh, thanks, to speak Joe. with us today. And um, I, uh, I thought maybe we could start at the, uh, at the beginning. Uh, tell me a little bit about your, your early life and how music came into mm -hmm. it and, sure. and, uh, yeah. and how you became interested in making things and, yeah. and all of that. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Yeah, well, I was born in Buenos Aires. Argentina, and uh, that's where I studied. Um, I stu started studying piano at around nine years old. Um, I was interested in, in music, I guess, and my family said, well, you should learn an instrument, and I did. They were hoping for something smaller, but <laughs> I, I wanted a piano, right? Um, I, my mother used to play a lot of classical music and a small record player, and I guess that, that was my introduction uh, to music in a sense. So um, eventually I went to you know, high school and I still uh, was studying piano. Um, when I finished high school, I couldn't make up my mind on what to do because I also like engineering. My, mm. my dad is an engineer. So as I couldn't make up my mind, I actually did both, right? And that was kind of crazy. Uh, I studied uh, electronic engineering in the University of Buenos Aires and uh, music, uh, eventually in the conservatory, in the National Conservatory in Buenos Aires mm. also, uh, pretty much at the same time. Uh, in high school, by chance, I had been introduced to electronic sound, and I still remember the day our teacher, music teacher, played uh, Switched on Bach for oh, us. Oh, uh-huh. <laughs> electronic synthesizers playing Bach, and, and I said, wow, okay, electronic right, wow, sound. Right, yeah, I'm uh -huh. interested in this. Um, so, um, my dad also gave me, at some point, uh, one of this kind of Lego kits for electronics. It was oh, called the uh -huh. Electronics Philips. So you I was are doing it of its day, right? Yeah, I was, exactly. Yeah. I was <laughs> yeah. tinkering with that, yeah. and, and I, I remember trying to make a keyboard out of it with an oscillator. Oh, fantastic. It was not very good, but... <laughs> right, but what an adventure, right? Yeah, yeah. It, was, it, was, it was interesting. So, when I started studying engineering and music seriously, um, I wanted to have a synthesizer, right? And I couldn't afford one. They were very expensive at the time. So I decided to build one, uh, which I did. Uh, it took me a long time. I built two of them. The first one uh, was kind of a copy of an ARP Odyssey. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, you know, voltage control, you know, patch curve programmable. And... Um, I learned how not to build one, right, the first right, time. Right, the first time, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but eventually I got started on the second one, which was uh, my own design, um, which still works, you know. And together with the synthesizer, I started building up uh, my own home studio. Mm. So eventually I got a four-track open-reel tape recorder, started making experiments with electronic sounds. For me, it was a discovery and a learning experience of what sound was, how it was made up, because I, I had never actually played with a synth before. I mm -hmm. built mine. So I was building module by module. Each one was a discovery of what... Of a new musical yeah, universe, exactly. right? Yeah. And I was connecting them and playing around. Um, so that was very exciting. Um, and eventually I had my own little home studio where mm. I was doing experiments. In, and I was also going to concerts... Uh, the LIPM, which is a lab in Buenos Aires, Laboratorio de Investigación y Producción Musical, which means um, Musical Research and Production Laboratory, mm -hmm. was hosting uh, concerts pretty much every week of uh, computer music and mm. electronic music. So I used to go there and started knowing, you know, a little bit people that were in the same um, wavelength, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
and and that was the that part that changed a little bit with computers and digital synthesizers. I managed to buy a very cheap one, one of the first, uh, which was a ZC101. Oh, right. Casio. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a Commodore 64 at the time. I built a MIDI interface. And with that and the open reel tape recorders, I made the first, I would say, interesting piece, complete piece, called Quest, mm -hmm. uh, which was actually 12 instances of this... Uh, CZ101 playing, you know, a piece. Wow. Yeah. Oh. And that, I finished that in 86, 87, I think. And it actually went ahead to win a mention in Burgess. Oh. So that was, Great. that was interesting. So, uh, so I was, at the time, when I finished engineering, uh, I started working in industry in Buenos Aires, in a small startup that was doing, uh, you know, making, designing telecommunication equipment. And right. I was eventually in charge of uh, the R&D lab, uh, well, second in command. And we were about six, and we were designing small telephone exchanges. So that involved hardware, firmware, software. Mm -hmm. And at night, over, over the weekends, I was doing music when I could, right? Yeah. So that, that was two worlds. May I know, I have also heard about a third world because I understand that you were the uh, the national champion of Argentina in <laughs> model rocketry. Model rocketry. Yes, yeah, you have that, to tell us a little bit. That about was that. a different life. That was much earlier. <laughs> that was much earlier. Yeah, that yeah. was when I was in high school. I was nuts about space flight and and you know exploration of space. And so I started you know building these little rockets and flying them all the time. Oh, uh, fantastic! Yeah, so that was. A lot of fun, and that was not music, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it was engineering. But it was way. engineering. Yeah, right. it was. You know, I'm I'm always in, in the edge of both fields, trying uh -huh. to balance. Right. Right. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, that that chapter closed when I finished high school. I think maybe a couple, a couple of years afterwards. Yeah. But I had a lot of fun, doing that. I built hundreds of them. <laughs> Yeah, crazy. I, I'm always struck at how strong the engineering thread is in your work. I mean, even here yeah, at yeah. Karma today, yeah, yeah. I think uh, you are like the Scotty of the Starship <laughs> Karma, right? That, that is, uh, is keeping the, or yeah. many of the installations here going. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, there's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of that. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so let's come back to your adventures in building your own uh, synthesizers Synthesizer, and so yeah. forth. Uh, uh, you know, after your first model, then you went on to the second, right? Yes, the second one, uh, which I still use, I designed myself. So that was built from scratch, uh, meaning the electrical, electronic design, the mechanical design. I hand etched the printed circuit boards, uh, soldered in all the components, um, and, and it worked. Mm. And it was very, it is, you know, still today very stable. It can be used in performance. I never dreamed at the time that I would use it in a concert performance, right? No, oh, it was because just for your it, home. Yeah, it's, well, it was a monophonic. It is a monophonic right. synthesizer. You can't do that match. It, it's not a, a super complex MOOC system or a book class system mm. with, you know, 10 oscillators. It's pretty simple. Um, so I used in conjunction with the open reel tape recorders to overdub and create textures and, and do stuff. But uh, it stayed in Buenos Aires, so I, I moved here eventually. That's another chapter of the story. But after maybe 15 years, I brought it from Buenos Aires. Uh, I fixed the power supply that, that had died, resuscitated it, added um, a MIDI to control voltage interface, which didn't have so I could mm. control it from computers and, and MIDI keyboards and controllers. And actually started using it in performance. So this is El Dinosaurio, El right? Dinosaurio, yeah. Right, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I, I have used it several times, uh, uh, usually pr processed through a computer, mm -hmm. um, in which I use uh, you know open source software that loops it and processes it. and. So I build textures layer by layer by recording what I play, changing parameters, recording again, mm -hmm. live, right? Mm -hmm. And with that, I, I've done quite a few pieces. Uh, it even traveled twice to Germany and mm -hmm. survived. 
So yeah. I, I used it in concert once in the Linux audio conference in 2007 in Cologne. Yeah. And when I was the Edgar Varese uh, professor in, in TU Berlin in 2008, I took it again, and mm -hmm. it was also part of a concert. Um, right. Not to mention that we recently had the pleasure to hear it in the Vexations, vexations Revex, yeah. uh, Revexed yeah. event in uh, in Berkeley about yeah. three or four months ago. Two sets. But it was the talk of the event. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was, it was fun. It yeah. is fun. Yeah. To use. And I'm surprised it has survived, but it has. Yeah. Right. And this is it, is it not, yep. uh, here next to you, right? Yep. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, it's a, a very grand project and uh, and still uh, uh, producing amazing sounds decades after mm -hmm. its original yeah. Yeah. Uh, design. I was really intrigued by the way that you used it. I mean, essentially, you did a brain transplant on it by mm -hmm. now making it computer controlled yep. and yeah. uh, and uh, really extending its its scope enormously from, mm -hmm. from the yeah, original yeah, yeah, concept. Yeah. 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 It's And it's it's funny in the sense that uh, once I got it here and fixed it and put it in my office, people would drop by and say, wow, what is that? Mm -hmm. And um, Because they're kind of fashionable again. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Analog synthesizers. Oh, I you think know, so. For a while yeah. they were kind of forgotten, but now they're you know, recognized as, as interesting machines that cannot mm -hmm. be really, really, really mimicked uh, through computers mm -hmm. they have their own character this this one has its own sound it yeah, has a very bad, distinct personality yeah, ba bad sound sometimes difficult to control uh, you have to know what to do and what not to do but uh, the result is interesting that's part of the charm of yeah, analog synthesis yeah, right yeah. yeah you can never repeat things yeah so. yeah so but anyway yeah so it um it's interesting when when I have found out about some of your your earlier works. Uh, then I, it seems like you have gone between different worlds that involve sometimes pure electronics and sometimes mm -hmm. using uh, you know, more conventional keyboards and yep. things like that. Yep. Uh, to, yeah. Could you talk a little bit about sure. that? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the piece I, I talked before, Quest with the small digital, was done in Buenos Aires, and then. What happened is that um, LIPM, this lab I, I oh, right. talked about mm -hmm. a moment ago, uh, the director organized um, an exchange program that involved LIPM and Karma and CME at the time at UCSD. Okay. Right? So people would travel, and this was uh, supposed to, to last for three years, right? So I was the first one that was sent here to Stanford. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. the, the connecting link be between the three centers were the next computers, actually. Right, okay. Uh, yeah. Shared software, uh, shared music, shared ways of doing things uh, digitally. Mm -hmm. So I came here to learn about that. And um, was here first for six months as a visiting composer, learning, going to the classes and everything. Then another six months because uh, Chris Chafe actually invited me to help teach in the summer workshops. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to Buenos Aires. But in the meantime, I had met a um, student from Japan that was uh, posting a position in his university uh, because he was creating a, a new electronic music lab. I applied and I won and I went to Japan mm, eventually. Mm -hmm. um, so while I was in Japan, I continued working with uh, software synthesis on the next computer, mm. right? Uh, when I came to Karma, that was my introduction to software synthesis, non-real time or real time mm. in computers, right? And I continued working on that uh, when I was in Japan. And it was at the time that I, uh, because the next were fantastic, they had uh, high quality CD uh, style stereo sound right. in a Unix workstation, which was uh, very unusual, you know, out of the box, mm -hmm. but it was just stereo. And the world here at Karma before the Nex had been quad. Right. Because the, the Samsung box and the Funli computer that was controlling it was four channel. So for me, it was kind of a missed opportunity. I arrived here just at the time that the Funli and the Samsung box were being retired. Oh, I see. So right. I started working in stereo, but I wanted to more than stereo. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I did was actually to, as I've done many times, build my own... Uh, little box um, 
together with Atau Tanaka, who was here at, at Karma. Oh, your Japanese at the time. colleague, right? Yeah. Well, he was working here, mm -hmm. um, but he was not the the one that had hired me. I see. He was a student at Karma, ah. and we were. I was in Japan at the time, and he was here. So he was designing the hardware side. Uh, and I was designing the software that would match it. And between the two of us, we got these little boxes that could plug into a Next and could play for, sh for channel sound files. Mm. So we had four channels. I started working, I had started working with uh, Lisp, the language, mm -hmm. uh, using a toolkit for um, sound synthesis and processing called CLM, mm. Common Lisp Music, written by Bill Shostad, mm. who had written tons of software for that for the Funli and the Samsung box. Oh, right. Okay. Right? So he was the architect of a lot of the software that was used for music creation and research at Karma mm. before the next. When the next arrived, he started porting all that stuff to a different software environment. And at the time, he chose uh, Lisp as the base language. Mm -hmm. So I was using that, which was an unreal time software synthesis system completely open no limits as long as you're willing to wait for the result right mm -hmm. so and in japan i added this extra dimension of having four channels and i wrote software that enabled me to move sound in space right in the footsteps of john chowning and, mm -hmm. and everyone else at karma that had been developing that for years and with that i uh, composed three dreams uh, which was my first uh, four-channel quad piece. Um, and that was finished in 1993. Mm. And in 1993, I came back to Karma Hired as the systems administrator and, mm -hmm. and lecturer. And I've been working here since then. Mm. Uh, in 94, using the same system, I wrote uh, the initial version of Knock Knock, anybody there right in the piece that will be they will be playing concert. right yeah, yeah exactly which was a quad piece it was written in clm and common music rick toby wrote another subsystem in lisp that dealt with uh higher level entities uh, like notes and phrases and algorithmic generation of those mm -hmm. and clm the part that bill shostad wrote dealt with uh um sound synthesis prim primarily Right. And, and processing. The, the two together has created an environment that was very rich for experimentation and creation of novel sounds mm -hmm. in the tradition of uh, Music 5 from Max Matthews sure. on, right? Um, and speaking of Max Matthews, didn't you have some involvement with the radio drum as yeah. well? Yeah. That yeah, was talk about that a little yeah. bit. Yeah. That was a and describe layer. what a radio drum is. For yeah, the radio then. drum is, is a three-dimensional controller that Max Matthews invented and perfected while at Karma, and it's uh, it looks like a pizza box, right? Um, and you have two batons. The pizza box has five um, radio antennas on its surface, mm -hmm. and each one of the batons is a radio transmitter. And the the main box has also A to D converters and circuitry and a microprocessor that interprets the signals coming from the receivers and based on the strength figures out where in space are the batons. Mm -hmm. So if you move them around, the intelligence in that pizza box is figuring out where they are and sending, sending out MIDI commands that tell an external computer, you know, where, wh what is happening. Right. And if a baton hits the surface, that's detected as well, and so on and so forth. And Max developed a lot of software for it, um, and he used it a lot to play, to, to conduct. For him, it was a conducting uh, tool where he would beat time and control expression of a pre-recorded MIDI sequence, and he would you know, do a demo and be playing the Fifth Symphony mm -hmm. um, and you know, being a conductor, right? Um, so when I saw that, I, I, I liked it, you know, the physicality of being able to control things by... The mallet-like action of yeah, the well, sticks and... Yeah, there's, well, there's two, two aspects to it. One is the, the, the triggering of things, from right. my point of view, right? Mm -hmm. And the other one is the, the continuous control that you can have at, if you wave around the batons in space. The theremin-like right? control, yes, right? Exactly. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So yeah. 
So what I did is to write, this was again in the next computer, uh, and I wrote, a, right. yeah, I, I wrote a program that I called Padmaster that was uh, a software package that would um, take this surface and uh, tile it, right? So you would have pads on it, virtual pads, that you would see on the screen, and oh. that you could hit, mm -hmm. right? And each one of those pads uh, could contain a sound file or could contain a sequence of MIDI commands. Right. Right, that, okay. that would be triggered in, in different ways. Uh, so when you hit one of those virtual paths, uh, you could program it so that it would play the next note in the sequence, or you could program it so that it started playing, you know, like conducting an orchestra of mm -hmm. performers, and you would Bringing say, well, you, voice, start, uh, right, you, know, yeah. you start, and they would continue playing, and you could stop them, and you could uh, stop all of them. Um, and furthermore, you could for each one of those paths, tie um, up to six axes of control to continuous controllers in MIDI. Mm. So when you triggered a, a pad and it started playing something, which went to an outside synthesizer, of course, uh, you could also control different parameters like panning, amplitude, modulation, strength, or anything by moving, in, in my case, the left baton mm -hmm. in the air, right? And the mappings for each one of those paths could be different. So you could have several voices playing, and a, a, a simple movement would change parameters in all those voices in different ways. So mm -hmm. you could get very, very complex behaviors out of the software if you program things appropriately. Right. right. And then as an added bonus, I All had under the gestural control. Uh, all all real-time. It, it was a mixture of uh, pre-composed sections and improvisation. Well, so and useful for improvisation it, it, work, that's, right? That's how I used it. I yeah. mean, others tried to use it more as a playback device, but it was not meant to be that. It was meant to be an environment where you would play with the with what you built mm -hmm. and create a piece in real time, which is the essence of, of improvisation. And then you, you had a special pass that you used to sort of flip pages in a oh. score, so you would redefine the whole surface right. by, by, by by changing the page. By so changing the page, so right. so to speak, while the previous page was still active and playing and everything, right? So all oh, right, so it's still so executing, but it, the control but interface the control changed. is a different one. So right. you start right. other things. So <clears throat> the piece, the solo piece called House of Mirrors, which was the last I did with that system, had. I don't remember, maybe seven, eight pages. Oh. And through the performance, you went through that. Right. It was kind of like a score. So right, it, sure. It, it had a certain form, but the details were different for each performance, right? So it was not completely improvised, uh, but also not completely deterministic. Right, not closed either. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. How fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So that was my foray into, you know, weird controllers and, uh -huh. and this was controller uh, controlling external synthesizers to TG77s mm -hmm. which had custom programming right so all the patches in those synthesizers were not the stock patches that came with the TG but rather sounds I built for that piece right right and as I was using two I did that on purpose because I could have quad out of that you know, right stereo from one stereo from the other to you know, sharing patches and sharing things so that you could move things around and 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 create some round. Yeah. Cheaply, but effectively. Right. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, from what I understand, I think once you once you went beyond uh, two sound systems in stereo, two sound sources in stereo, yeah. into more, you have never looked back since then. And since, you know, that time, spatialization and the control of, of spatial motion yeah. of sound uh, has been critical for your work. Yeah, it has yeah. always been part of my pieces since then. I haven't gone back to stereo, actually. I, yeah. I can do mix downs to stereo under duress, but <laughs> right. but it's much better if you if you can listen to an original surround mix of, of what I've done uh, so far. So as a, as a composer, what, what are the kinds of strategies that you use for spatialization, or how, how do you conceptualize you know, the, the palette of possibilities that spatialization offers you? Well, I mean, it depends on the piece. 
um, uh, usually my pieces have um, sections that are very complex or have many, many sounds in mm -hmm. them. Uh, one of the advantages of working with surround is that you literally have more space to put those sounds so that they can be individually picked apart by the brain. It's like oh, right, yeah, rather than just becoming a, a part of an ocean of sound. Exactly. Right, so right, it, yeah. it's the difference between listening to even a very good recording of a symphonic orchestra, right? Right. And being there in the concert hall, where right, you where have you, the individual you can sources, the different, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. and and the effect is completely different. I mean, you can, both ways you enjoy the music, but but there's something that is very difficult to convey through a stereo recording. That's the the immersion that you have um, in a concert hall in mm -hmm. the sound, and the way that the brain uh, can pick up, you know, all the uh, instruments and the sections of the orchestra. And, and pay attention to one and not to the other, and so on and so forth, which in very good recourses you can do that, but not to the same extent. Yeah. So that's one aspect, which is opening up space so that sounds can, so that you can have more complex textures, but they're not kind of hidden mm. or drowning in the others. They're not muddy. And they're not yeah, muddy, they're right. spread out. Uh, another obvious use of space is for moving the sources. Uh, and the contrast between, you know, point sources coming from a certain direction and then suddenly sound opening up and enveloping you, mm -hmm. or sound sources moving, uh, which can be a cliche as well. Uh, yeah. But uh, but if it's used artistically with a certain reason behind it, is very effective and can make a big difference in the perception. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I think it reaches maybe back far into evolutionary biology as well. My understanding is the reason why humans have the ability to discern different pitches is sort of a side effect of the ability to localize sounds in space. Hmm. You know, yeah. the, the Doppler effect of the sound coming mm -hmm. into each ear differently and, yeah. the, and subtle pitch differences uh, help with the localization. So that would mean that spatialization and pitch perception are unconsciously united in, in some kind of continuum. Yeah, yeah. yeah. everything is tied together. Yeah. yeah. So this, this of course, figures very much in, in your work, Knock Knock, anybody mm -hmm. there, too. Yeah. Tell us a bit about, about that, you know, yeah, the, 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 the idea. Yeah, the way Yeah. Yeah, th that was, uh, it was a collaboration, actually, with some uh, artists that created an installation, and I provided the sound for it. So the way we did it, it was about insanity, actually. So the way we did it is we actually met with a few friends, we must have been maybe seven or eight, in the recording studio right next door, uh, around a couple of uh, microphones in the center of the room, and we talked uh, about insanity, and someone read a poem, and uh, uh, we told stories, uh, personal and otherwise, uh, while the dad recorder was running, right? Um, eventually we <laughs> said enough is enough and we went to have some uh, drink or something and somebody stayed and played the piano while we were talking and that I left the recording running, right? So after the fact, what I did is to transfer that recording in its entirety to the computer, listen to it and start picking up parts of it, you know, like you would have done with tape you uh -huh, know, right. a long time ago right but digitally and building at the same time a program in Lisp in CLM and CM that contain all those cut points so you would have like a verb if you may or a function name that would play something a section mm -hmm. of, of that recording in a certain way and had a bunch of parameters that you could use to change the nature of how it was played okay right so it, it was a matter of slowly building a vocabulary, in a sense, mm -hmm. and tying it together into a musical form. Um, and Did you find that you built a syntax as well as a vocabulary? No, it was not that, not that uh, way. Uh, way yeah. not, not that way. It was very intuitive. It was, uh -huh. it was building a story, actually. Right. So there is a story if you listen to the words of uh, Knock Knock Anybody There. Uh, which is not necessarily linear or connected or, you know, has an ending, but but there is something 
mm-hmm. which is lifted from that conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, and and the proce- in this case, the process of musical creation is, as in many other of my pieces, a mix of writing software and doing the music. Mm-hmm. And for me, there is no difference between the two. Making tools and then using the exactly. tools. Exactly. Right? It's, yeah. it's part of the same process of artistic creation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so as I am creating something, in this case, a quad piece, I am writing the software that I need for that and extending the software, creating new instruments, creating new ways of processing in a loop that is closed by my ears. And right, because then the new criteria. tools will reveal new possibilities exactly, for you. Exactly, and, yeah. and, um, and, and at the same time, it's also an exploration of sound. Each one of my pieces somehow explores the sound and tries to see what that particular sound has to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's very exploratory and some, I mean, sometimes I have an idea of what I want and I get it. Sometimes I don't get what I want and it's better. Uh, sometimes I make a mistake and, mm-hmm. or a bug and it sounds great <laughs> and right. that's the direction I go. So it's, um, sometimes it all goes well and I, everything sounds as I think it should. Uh, but that's not always the case, and that's not the fun part, right? Yeah. Um, in a way. So that's how this piece evolved. Initially, it was a stereo piece, but then I uh, extended into quad. Uh, it was a stereo piece for the installation, and then I extended it into a standalone uh, piece for quad playback. Mm-hmm. And it was premiered in 1994. Right. Right. Yeah. And and like El Dinosaurio, then lay dormant yeah. for a long time and yeah. was re- revived in a somewhat different form. Yes, yes. Uh, something I did last year. Um, I, I had done that for a different piece in 2008, which was to re-render it, right? Because these pieces are software. Mm-hmm. And if you have the original source materials and you have the software, you run the software, you get another version of the piece. Um, in this particular case, it was the software was so old I couldn't run it on, on any computer, and I didn't want to run it because it would take a long time to recompile. Right. So what I did was to port it to the last version or the latest version of CLM, the same software package. But in the meantime, CLM has changed a lot. Bill a Shusted, lot, right. Yeah, Bill Shusted has been working, toiling on it for all these years. And, uh, for example, now it runs in Scheme, which is a dialect of Lisp, mm-hmm. yeah, and it runs in a scheme that Bill Shostad wrote. Uh, so the, the very language it's running on, it's also written by Bill. Um, so I started in the, you know, doing this uh, work of trying to see if I could translate it and, and have it sound the same. Um, and it was not easy, but I finally got it just in time for uh, the transitions concert that happened last year in the backyard right. of, of the yeah. hall, in which I played the, the first version I managed. That was a, a majestic experience to hear that piece uh, out in the open. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 was, it was a very good performance. Um, at the time, I had set up the, a full 3D system of speakers. We, we have a system we've been deploying lately that uh, has 24 speakers, six subwoofers, and it's arranged in a dome configuration, so you have really uh, sound coming from everywhere, mm. right? Not from uh, under the ground, like in this room, yeah. the listening room, in which we have speakers below the floor as well. Right. But um, but you could have sound from everywhere, and that's uh, that was my target for rebuilding the piece. So the piece originally was done. On the next computers, uh, the output was a four-channel sound file at 44.1 kilohertz and 16 bits, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what was played last year and what I have here for the concert is a 32-bit floating point rendering of the same materials. Uh, and uh, it is rendered to third-order ambisonics, so it can be played back on any you know, rig of speakers for which you have an ambisonics decoder, and these days it's easy to do that. 
Right. So I, I can play it in this room over 22 channels. Uh, I can play it using a ring of eight, as we will do yeah. in, mm -hmm. the, in the concert. Uh, or I can play it with a dome of 24 channels like I did last year. Uh, it's very flexible, and it's not just quad anymore. It's yeah. a much, much, much nicer, balanced uh, specialization. Uh, the flexibility is fantastic, too. Yeah. Now you can go to all these different situations without yeah. having to port and recode and, you anything. know, yeah. all of that. You just need a decoder. It's fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you made amazing use of, of many techniques in that piece, but especially of sample rate conversion. I, I have never really heard anyone take sample rate conversion to quite the, 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 the lengths that yeah, you took it, it in that piece. It's pretty much the only thing that's going on uh -huh. all the time. Uh, yeah. So uh, what I basically did is very simple. I created a software instrument where the sampling rate conversion which uh, normally would be speed up or slow down of the playback rate, right, mm -hmm. of, of a sound file, could be modulated, um, extremely modulated, through, you know, sinusoidal oscillators or, uh, you know, low-frequency noise components or envelopes, mm -hmm. right? So, and it's a single instrument, software instrument, with many parameters. So it can be made to sound um, very different depending on the parameters that you that you supply. But uh, in the piece, uh, there's, uh, you know, literal phrases that are, you know, recognizable as such. Um, sometimes they trans migrate into vibrato and extreme vibrato. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you hear what sounds like uh, filter sweeps um, very fast. And it's actually very fast changes in sampling rate conversion. Yeah, that, I was really you know, fascinated by that because you, you got these, these computationally expensive effects actually in a much cheaper way yeah, by, by yeah, just yeah, pulling yeah. around with the sampling rate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very elegant and economical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ag again, it was a discovery process mm -hmm. while playing with the sound and listening to them and see, you know, how, you know, how do we treat this? Um, to, to be recognizable sometimes, to be extremely weird some other times. Mm -hmm. uh, even the, the, the jam piano session that happened at the end of the talk made it into the piece. And right. so there are several layers of pianos that are being transposed slightly and beat, and they go far away and they come back. Yeah, uh, since I'm a pianist, I love the way you use piano sounds <laughs> in some of your pieces, or, or you know, others of yours, like the Fractal Cat series and, uh, yeah, and so yeah. forth, uh, you That's know, are, are brilliant yeah. uh, examples of, of pianism in the modern electronic age uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's really wonderful yeah, yeah that was a different a, a different way of doing improvisation uh -huh. that i started working on in 2008 uh-huh with algorithmic assistance and yes yeah yes mm -hmm. it's, so it's an aug augmented piano right. so i i come from a classical piano training background mm -hmm. i i used to play you know classical piano complex pieces not anymore Right, right, uh, but your but, but, but your the gestures your real time the, playing skills are very yeah. high. I you know as I've heard in concerts. Yeah, so it's, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not the same thing as as sitting in front of a score and no, playing no, it. No, yeah, right, no, yeah. But still, the, the 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 dexterity and the gestural content of piano playing, I, I haven't lost right. completely. So th they're there. I can exploit that. And I again in that case, I built software to help me and to augment that uh, mm -hmm. in different ways. And it ended up being a pretty complex program. It's like a 5,000 line program that, oh, right. that yeah. controls the whole piece, uh, which can last up to you know 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Again, has sections and different types of processing and synthesis. It uses uh, sample pianos. It can use a disc clavier if it's available right. as well. And I I have had a lot of fun playing that. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. a lot of fun to listen yeah. to it too. Yeah. 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 So um, you know, moving on to the you know the present and the future, what are you working on on nowadays, and and what what are your objectives as a as a composer and a computer musician? Yeah. For for real time pieces, I've been doing a couple of things that are derived from earlier work in a way. Um, so there's this. Uh, continued evolution of this piano piece, augmented piano piece, mm. 
uh, it's written in Super Collider, which I found to be a, a very expressive and complete language for computer music uh, when you need real-time processing. So using that and samples that I had, uh, I've created um, a piece where I can trigger behaviors again, uh, not using the radio drum, but using uh, a launch pad, one of these uh, you know, pad controllers mm -hmm. that had a lot of pads. Uh, so I wrote some Super Collider classes that let me trigger uh, players. In mm -hmm. this case, a very rhythmic stuff, right? And that's what I played, and I think you were there for the uh, uh, Modulations uh, concerts. Oh, the most recent year. one? Yeah, like the most recent one. Yeah, just a couple of months ago. Yeah, or, exactly. Right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so that one was something pretty recent that I just right. finished in okay. time for the concert, mm -hmm. and it's different from other things I've done in the past. And I've been doing also other piece, another piece called Earth Songs, in which I use resynthesis and um, extremely complex, in a way, c uh, control of the resynthesis process to generate phrases that sound like chants and, and singing. Mm -hmm. uh, and f from that, I build a very static piece that evolves very slowly that I play from a laptop. Uh, almost no movements, mm -hmm. but uh, I think it's very effective mm. in that very minimalistic way. Mm. As for the future, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Um, I would like to go back a little bit to non-real-time software synthesis, uh, where I can compose my piece in space, uh, perhaps a larger form piece. Uh, I have a couple of installations that I've had in mind for a long time, and I have plenty of materials. I just need to find the time. Yeah, those take a long. And time. And uh, something that I've heard you do recently too is is not just moving sounds in space, but recreating spaces that are in other places. Like when you recreated the space of of the Hagia Sophia Cathedral in Istanbul. Yeah. You know, to to mm -hmm. make a virtual performance taking place in that space. Yeah, it was that physically was happening here, but with the space of, of that place in Turkey instead. Yeah, that was quite a project. That was actually a, a shared project with uh, Jonathan Abel, who did the simulation, mm -hmm. and Vicera Pincheva from the Arts History Department, who got samples and was very interested in, in doing that. There's a whole project at Karma called Icons of Sound. Um, you can find out more about it and deals with things like archaeological acoustics, and in this case, a recreation of a space that still is exists but can't be used for music anymore. But so has wonderful musical properties. Well, yes, it's a huge dome. It's the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul in Turkey, yeah. uh, which used to be uh, a mosque uh, and a church and then another different church and eventually became a museum. And the, the aim of this project was to to see how mus music of that time would sound in that space, something you cannot... Oh, right. It hasn't, it hasn't how happened. How it would sound in the space it was designed for. Exactly. Right. So mm -hmm. something that hadn't happened in that space for, say, 500 years. Right. Right. So there's no recordings. There's no... So what Jonathan Abel was, was doing was recreating from a, a, a couple of impulse responses that Viseria managed to record, which was very difficult getting the permissions to do that. Um, from that, he recreated um, a bunch of un uncorrelated uh, impulse responses that uh, were used um, a few years ago to create a first try at this, in which he recorded the Capella Romana group, eight singers, mm -hmm. uh, dry, up in the stage, which is our small concert hall. So they were being fed through uh, headphones, sounds, from a, a, a subset of those impulse responses so that they could sing in the space, otherwise mm -hmm. they can't. But uh, he recorded the dry signals okay. of all the signal, uh, singers. And then added um, the, space. the space around it. Right. And, yeah. and we, we can play this here in this room very effectively. We, we did that in 2011 outside. It's a very short piece, three minutes long, but mm -hmm. it was amazing yeah. to have it outside. Last year, uh, we did a real-time version with two singers outside again in the backyard. Yes, I heard that. Our, that was yeah. wonderful. Right. And that was you know, a good first try. 
Yeah. But the thing is, uh, this year there was a concert scheduled in the opening uh, season of the Bing Concert Hall, mm -hmm. which is a big concert hall that was just inaugurated here at, at Stanford in January. And the concert was uh, a full concert of the Capella Romana group. In the first half of the concert, they sang in the uh, main concert hall uh, with the concert hall. That's it. In the second half, we turned on our system, and that concert hall became Hagia Sophia, mm. uh, which has a reverb time for reference of about 12 seconds or so. Oh, okay. Like right. different. So very different. Very, right. very, very different. Right. Uh, uh, I, I I think Bing, the the concert hall has has a lot of reverb, but that's 2.5 seconds. Yes, right. right. So this is 12. Yeah. So uh, the the singers, there were 15 singers uh, with wireless microphones being routed through a mixer for some, you know, spectral shaping, then going in one into one of our workstations. Uh, we run. Uh, Linux workstations, very powerful in special cases, no noise, no fans. And uh, from that uh, workstation, we were feeding 24 speakers uh, that were uh, set up in a dome around the audience mm. and six subs to complement the, the low end. And the computer was running, I think it was 48 16 second convolutions all the time. Oh, being right. specialized right. in real time in ambisonics, uh, and it did work, and it was quite quite astonishing. Quite, quite yeah. astonishing to to hear it, and and the the audience response was uh, very good. Yeah. Uh, furthermore, the response from the singers was very good because mm -hmm. according to them, we talked to them afterwards. It was the the first time they had been able to interact meaningfully with an artificial environment of this kind. Right. Because when they sing, they adjust their singing to the space, and they, sure, hunt, right. they hunt for resonances. Right, 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 right. And apparently they could do that, so we were not doing too bad. Right, so it could function in the same yeah. way as a real environment. Not exactly, but, but they were happy, very yeah, happy. Yeah, and how, how grand to use cutting-edge technology to cre recreate sounds of the past that have been yeah. lost. Uh, well, to, to recreate something that could not happen today, even though right. the space is there. Right, I mean, but in theory it could happen, there. but... The yeah, but you couldn't go there and sing. Right, that's not the forbidden. sociological practice of yeah. the way that yeah. space is used in the modern world. So, right? yeah. so, they, so, so we managed to, to bring that back. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh. Fernando, <laughs> thank you so much for uh, speaking with us no, today. Thanks. It is uh, wonderful to hear about all your projects and, and, uh, and all of these uh, fantastic new ideas. Uh, we're really looking forward to hearing the piece uh, well, in too. the uh, yeah, Outside yeah. the Music Summit Festival. Yeah. And uh, thanks again for making time sure. to talk with yeah. us today. Thank you.